Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, as Cheryl said, I work for the Western Wildland Environmental Threat Assessment Center. I mean, yeah, Environmental Threat Assessment Center. WETAC, which is a west-wide unit within Forest Service Research, but it's administered by the PNW. I'm a research social scientist, and most of my work involves investigations of the social and cultural influences on how people, different social groups, perceive and respond to environmental risks and threats like wildfire, invasive species, climate change. I was asked to talk today about community and social networks in part because I've been doing work um, using a social network approach to understanding communities and um, the opportunities that the structure of those communities exhibit for communication of information and <coughs> complex problem solving and collaboration. So what I'm going to talk about today is um, a little bit about, a, I guess, providing you with a framework for looking at communities, communities of place, as well as communities of interest, and um, a framework for understanding the conditions in those communities and how those com conditions may facilitate different kinds of opportunities for communication with the public. So um, opportunities for the communication of information, um, barriers to communicating with certain groups because they're closed and maybe not open to new ideas, opportunities for innovation and collaboration with different um, parts of communities. And also how to identify different roles that organizations or individuals play that may be really pivotal, pivotal and important um, and, and that may serve as important contacts for uh, agencies. First, I thought I would just define a few terms. The term community um, is often considered um, a place, you know, where people live. It's a geographic expression. But it's also, um, community can also refer to a community of interest, a group of people or organizations with a common, that perceive a common problem or, or who have a common goal. And that's often how I use the term community. Uh, a community is a system of social interactions. Um, people interacting uh, together, but also organizations. And I often, um, my work really focuses on uh, s interactions among organizations because organizations, whether they're formal organizations like agencies or informal associations of people are really important, um, not only because they represent the interests of a wider group of people in a community, but also because they play an important role in controlling the flow of information, determining what kinds of information flows through a community, um, and determining access to resources. And they kind of mediate the relationship between members of maybe a community of place or a community interest and the larger st social um, structural forces, political and economic forces. I mean, finally, community is a source of mutual identity. People who belong to a community perceive, <laughs> have some commonalities, often perceive a common threat or a common opportunity. An important concept in rural sociology when you're talking about communities, um, especially natural resource communities, is this idea of a community field, which is considered an arena for social interaction that's oriented towards the interests of, a larger, um, of the larger community rather than special interests, though of course special interests are operating within a community. The community field is generally that kind of arena where um, individuals or organizations are interacting for some sort of greater good. Social capital is another term I'll be talking about in this presentation, and it refers to the stock of relationships and norms of behavior that um, create opportunities for different kinds of processes, for communication, for cooperation. Um, and social capital also refers to <coughs> the conditions that create the ability for people or organizations to work together in collective response to problems and to mobilize resources in times of perceived need. So that's just a little kind of background on community and what I mean when I'm, t um, when I'm talking about community. I uh, use a social network approach to look at communities of interest mainly. Social networks are simply sets of individuals or organizations, in my case mainly organizations, and the patterns of interaction among them. It's basically a theoretical construct um, that refers to social structure as determined by these interdependencies. So these sets of individuals or organizations and what is transacted between them, information, resources, power, influence. And a social network approach is kind of unique um, in 
the world of you know, social science methods in that it really focuses on relationship. That's what's really important. Rather than the attributes of an individual person or organization, you know, their attitudes, beliefs, values, it's really the relationship between different kinds of individuals or organizations that's important. And it also um, assumes that actors aren't independent, that they're interdependent, that that individuals or organizations' beliefs, values, behavioral intentions um, don't, you know, develop in a vacuum. It's all through a process of social action, interaction, influence that that um, that f um, influences what how people think and what people and organizations do. Ties, so the relationships between individuals or organizations in social in a social network approach are channels for the exchange of information or resources. So looking at the ties is what's really important. And network structure, whether it evolves from the patterns of interaction or whether it's imposed on the patterns of interaction among people or organizations because of geography or you know, institutional or political kinds of um, rules. Network structure is really important because understanding it is really important because it enables and constrains these exchanges of information or resources among people. So those are the things that um, a social network approach focuses on. The underlying theory of social interaction that's really behind a social network approach um, is, is pretty simple. It basically assumes that people or organizations interact for three main kind of fundamental reasons. One is that people interact with others that are similar to them. That's this kind of birds of a feather adage. Um, and that's you know how we end up forming social and cultural groups. We seek out others who are similar to us, and then we become more similar the more we interact. Same thing goes for organizations. Um, people and organizations seek out others that have greater expertise or resources. They are looking for something that they don't already have in within their group, some sort of you know ideas, information, you know influence. And then people, of course, interact with others who are available, accessible, especially on the individual level. There's only so many relationships that an individual can maintain in their social world, and so. Um, you have to kind of pick and choose who you're going to interact with. And that's the same goes with organizations, especially when you're looking at units of organizations. Because um, organizations are really made up of people, and there's only so many social ties that an individual can maintain. And so you have to pick the people that are closest in terms of geography or that um, have social time or energy to interact with you. So um, different, as I was mentioning, different kinds of social structures or network structures imply different kinds of social processes. And so this is just a really kind of simplified um, figure that provides kind of the spectrum between two extremes of social structure that you might find in a community um, or the among the organizations in a community or individuals in a community. Um, at the top is this kind of really densely interconnected uh, structure um, that is um, that people associate with the idea of bonding capital. So you have a lot of dense ties. It's generally ties that um, occur within a group, within a social group. So within a group of individuals or organizations that have similar beliefs, values, behavioral attentions, intentions. So this kind of structure really reinforces social norms of behavior. Um, people interact because they share, they have commonalities, and interaction reinforces those commonalities and, um, and creates kind of understood norms of what is a, appropriate or expected behavior. These kinds of um, social structures are really um, help um, in the communication of information and uh, not just simple information but also complex knowledge because in general people have um, share some common assumptions, some common background. They, when, so when they're communicating a, about a complex issue, they don't necessarily need to step back and explain um, their assumptions. Um, they already have some commonalities on which to start a conversation with. And um, these kinds of structures are um, good for um, mobilization of resources and decision making because they're often very centralized. There may be a few individuals or organizations that are at the center of these kinds of um, networks um, that can um, influence what other people do or um, call other people to action. And then of, again, these, these kinds of work, um, structures are really good for um, leading to collective action because uh, like Bruce was talking about, in order to act collectively and to cooperate, you need high levels of trust. And high levels of trust comes with mutual understanding and um, sharing um, different you know, attributes, beliefs, values, 
And so these kinds of densely interconnected networks are facilitate or foster collective um, behavior. At the, very, at the other end, at the bottom, is more of this kind of sparsely connected network. And this is a network that is kind of characterized by loose ties rather than dense ties. And this generally is a network that connects um, different groups. So it's, it usually um, is between groups. So this is what you might find um, between organizations with different institutional beliefs and values or intentions or individuals with different um, cultural attributes. And this kind of structure where you have different kinds of individuals or organizations that wouldn't naturally um, be interacting because they're similar but probably are reaching out interacting with each other because they want they need information or resources, this kinds of structure is uh, from based on the organizational like the literature and um, business literature, there's a lot of research done on this. This kind of structure is really good for pro providing access to uh, rare information or knowledge. Um, for information, um, knowledge, resources you don't already have in your, in your group or among your set of colleagues. And for exposure to new ideas and new ways of doing things. And so this kind of structure um, really promotes innovation and complex problem solving. Not necessarily the communication of complex information, but complex problem solving because you're bringing multiple types of knowledge, multiple skill sets together to bear on a problem. And this is kind of that kind of structure that you might see in a collaboration network where people are brought together not because they're similar or organizations are brought together not because they're similar but um, they're different and they're the, you know, these uncommon bedfellows but do share one um, maybe common goal. And so they're, they're bringing together and leveraging each other's um, strategic advantages to achieve something greater. So that's a little um, background about different kinds of um, network structures you might find in communities of place and communities of interest um, that really facilitate different kinds of social processes that agencies like the Forest Service or the BLM might want to tap into, you know, in terms of if, you, if your goal is to, to, to communicate information or to influence opinion or, um, you know, this kind of top structure, it can, as long as the, the central organizations agree with those um, opinions, they may help disseminate that information. But if that's the kind of community you're dealing with and they are not amenable, to you know, the interests of an agency, then they may be very closed and may be very hard to penetrate. Whereas this bottom structure might be better, you know, a better kind of um, structure to try to engineer if you're trying to create a um, a network of organizations to be working with. If you want to to um, spread ideas and have people have organizations or people in a network um, be open to those ideas and willing to process them and make sense of them and come up with common strategies for addressing them. So I thought I'd just um, kind of drill down a little bit further to introduce you to some of the indicators or measures that I use in my work for looking at the social structure of communities. Um, it, and so I have these divided into kind of those bonding capital measures, so indicators of bonding capital and indicators of bridging capital. Density is a measure of the proportion of all possible ties that could exist in a network. I mean, you don't have to bound the network, so it could be a community of place or a set of organizations that work. I'll, I'll give you an example about a set of organizations that work on fire prone landscapes. But it's, it's the proportion of all possible ties that exist um, in a network. So how, how inter interconnected a network is. Degree, average degree, is the average number of ties held by the network actors, or degree is the number of ties that one actor holds. And so the more ties that an actor holds, the you know, more chance that actor has to influence others. At the same time, if you have a lot of ties, you can be constrained because there's only so many ties that you can maintain. And if you've kind of reached your maximum, it's hard to be open to, to you know, new alliances. And then centralization is how centralized a network is, the, the extent to which it's kind of like a star shape where there's really one or a small set of individuals or organizations at the center that um, are really controlling the flow of information out to kind of the more peripheral actors in the network. Bridging capital measures that I use in my work and that I'm going to um, talk about in an example is um, our cross-boundary exchange, which is the proportion of ties in a network that connect different types of actors. So that's kind of getting at that kind of a loose um, tie structure that I had at the bottom of that, the previous slide. So how many ties you know, br um, connect um, organizations that prioritize, you know, recreation versus um, 
you know, aesthetics or conservation of, you know, old growth structure or something, or in the next case, how many, you know, the proportion of ties that connect organizations that are really focused on suppressing fire versus organizations that are interested in reintroducing fire and restoring um, the processes in fire prone landscapes. Brokerage um, is an indicator of um, the uh, brokerage is the frequency of indirect ties provided by a third party actor, so a mediator, um, a bridging actor, um, a boundary spanner. And there are a few different brokerage roles. One is a coordinator, so that's somebody who mediates the flow of information between two members of their own group that aren't otherwise connected. So helping to um, um, increase the flow of information or you know, resources or the spread of ideas within a group. A consultant is an is a actor in, a, in a one group that facilitates or mediates the flow of information between two actors in a different group, in a group that's different than the consultant's group. A gatekeeper is somebody who can control or facilitate the flow of information from an outside group into the gatekeeper's own, own group. And then a representative is the reverse, um, you know, an individual or an organization that can control or facilitate the flow of information from their own group to outside organizations. So these are just some roles you can identify organizations or individuals that are really um, playing, the, playing these roles through um, a network approach. So I thought I'd share a little case study, um, some preliminary results from a study that I'm involved in right now with Bruce. Um, and we're looking at the network of organizations. Well, my part of this, this study is, my sub-project is looking at the network of organizations involved in the management of Central Oregon's fire-prone landscape. And our goal is to characterize the, the network, so identify the key organizations, identify all the organizations that are involved in the management of fire-prone fire -prone landscapes in Central Oregon, and then identify the key organizations based on you know, different criteria understand their institutional beliefs and values and behavioral intentions regarding the management of fire prone landscapes, so how they perceive fire, what the goal of management should be, and then um, identify the, the patterns of interaction among these organizations. And we'd, we've been doing this through interviews with representatives of organizations, or in the case of complex organizations like the Forest Service where you have multiple levels, you, uh, we're ta we, we consider an organization a unit of an, organiza an organization like a ranger district. Um, so identify the patterns of interaction between individual representatives of those organizations for different purposes, working together, sharing information, getting advice. And then we're analyzing these patterns of interaction and trying to understand, using social theory, um, we're trying to understand the implications for, of these patterns for the communication of information about f on the management of fire-prone landscapes, for learning and complex problem solving, for how to deal with this problem of, of the accumulation of hazardous fuels um, and increased fire risk <coughs> that's threatening, threatening the built environment as well as um, the, the ecological systems and processes in these landscapes. And then trying to understand the implications of the patterns of interaction for coordination and collective action, coordinated you know, actions among, by these organizations. So this is our goal. Um, and then just here's a couple of pictures, a picture of our study area, which is basically um, to shoot the central and south central Oregon Ponderosa Pine Mixed Conifer um, Forest Landscape, it's Deschutes, Klamath, and Lake County. And so we uh, mapped out all the, we identified all the organizations, mapped them all out, and here's a picture of the network. And we superimposed, or we identified whether these organizations were fire organizations, so that were um, focused on fire protection, preparedness, and response. You know, these are generally agencies and landowners, private landowners who are really concerned about con um, managing fire, controlling fire, protecting the built environment or other assets. And then we identified the organizations that we call forest organizations, which are like public land management agencies, conservation organizations, um, and units of public land management organizations like ranger districts as opposed to maybe the fire protection divisions of organizations that are focused on managing um, the forest lands and uh, restoring forest lands or conserving, protecting. So here's a picture of the network and it's a little bit hard to see any patterns, um, you know, but, you can, but, but if you look closely you can see there's kind of this periphery and at the center, you're, you see these, there's these nodes, these organizations that actually are, have a lot more ties, that are more densely interconnected and they're more towards the center of the network. 
When you break the network up um, and you separate the forest organizations from the fire organizations, you actually can see some pretty clear patterns. The forest organizations are much more densely interconnected. They have a lot more of that structure that I was talking about early that reflects bonding social capital that's really good for the communication of information, for, um, for, for acting collectively, for coordinating, for mobilizing resources. So they have a much more st um, a cent centralized, um, densely interconnected interconnect network. The forest organization, I mean the fire organizations, however, are much more loosely um, connected. There are more, uh, theirs is more of a kind of a loosely connected network. They're not all connected, they're not very centralized. So you can already see some patterns just by mapping out the network. Um, and then you can also use, in, with social network analysis formally, you, you, know, you can go back to those variables that I was presenting earlier, those indicators, and you can, you can quantify some of that network structure and you can see that uh, although on average the organizations in the network have you know, three and a half ties, it's really the forest organizations that have a lot of ties. Um, they're, much, they're, they're much more connected, and that makes sense, given that picture. The fire organizations, on average, only you know, have name one other organization in response to the questions we asked, which is who do you interact with to, when you're for getting work done, sharing information, advice, things like that. In terms of the density, um, it's a large network. There, um, so, den so density is generally low in a large network because individual actors can only maintain so many ties. But um, you can see that although overall the density of the network is you know, less than 3% of, of all the ties that could exist do exist, um, density is higher among the forest organizations because they're more densely interconnected and, and um, centralized. Centralization, um, you can see that, that the, the network um, is you know, about a third towards being more like a star, like kind of a perfectly centralized organization. It's really the forest organizations that care, are caring or contributing a lot of that centralization. In terms of the bridging capital, um, you can, what you see here is um, about 30% of all the ties are between uh, fire and forest organizations in this particular case. So that sounds like a lot, but actually when you do some statistical analysis, it's, it's not as many as you uh, would be expected based on chance, given the number of nodes in, in the network. And um, both for the forest and the fire organizations, they're, they're crossing boundaries in their communication less than would be expected. So, in other words, neither of them are really reaching out and trying to access new information, expose themselves to new ideas, um, by reaching out of outside their um, their kind of social group, in terms of brokerage, you can see that um, there's a there's a, a high frequency. I mean, t this is all kind of relative, but there's a high frequency of coordinator brokerage where member a member within a group is facilitating the flow of information between two members of their own group and that's really more of an indicator of bonding capital where you're really trying to increase the flow of information and the communication within your own group i um, mean in terms of like the the bridging capital measures um, consulting brokerage is happening less than you would expect uh, by chance so neither forest or fire organizations are really helping to mediate the flow of information between so forest organizations aren't helping to mediate the flow of information between two fire organizations and the reverse also isn't happening fire organizations aren't trying to mediate the flow between two forest organizations so that in itself just shows that there's a limitation to how much information um, can be shared between these two types of organizations that have really two different goals for managing these land, the landscape and two, di two different sets of assumptions. So, you know, it, it's an indicator that, that there's not as much exposure to new ideas or learning that could be, um, not as much is happening as, as potentially could be. In terms of representative brokerage, there's more than would be expected by chance. So that means um, in the network, their uh, members of one group are representing their own group and helping to get information out to the members of another group. But it's not really due to the interactions um, uh, by forest or fire organizations in particular. So this is just to give you an example of kind of what can be done using a social network approach to trying to understand the, the social structure in a community or the landscape in a community. A couple more uh, little slides that I thought you might find interesting. This is um, basically looking at the network uh, um, 
and trying to identify who's really at the core and who's at the periphery by kind of creating a, uh, imposing kind of a, a cutoff um, based on the number of ties an actor has. And so if you have a certain number of ties, you're considered in the core, and if you have below a certain number of ties, you're considered on the periphery. And what you can see here is that most of the organizations in the core are the forest organizations, and most of the organizations in the periphery, the vast majority of the organizations in the periphery are the, are the fire organizations. And so what this says um, is just another way of looking at it, but um, it represents this really simplified structure down at the bottom, this, this little simplified figure, that in the core you've got this constant kind of set of interaction, this flow of, flow of ideas or information going um, uh, within, going around and around within this one group. And then you've got these periphery, this, these peripheral actors that are reaching out to the core and probably sharing information with them. So the core is benefiting from all that information coming in, but they're not necessarily sending information out. And so the core is becoming more, um, gaining a greater and greater strategic advantage with all this information and is able to use it, communicate it, mobilize it upon it. And the periphery kind of is left um, without the ability to, sh they're, they're sending their information to the core and they're not getting very much back and they aren't really gaining any um, they don't reflect any um, ability to coordinate because they're all kind of these dead ends. And then one other little um, analysis that I thought you might find of interest is a key player analysis that, um, that you can do. This basically is an analysis that looks at all the steps that it takes to get between different actors in a network. And in the, this is just a subset of the network, um, but in the green are the 15 organizations that are only two steps removed maximum from any other organization in the network. So this basically can help you identify which organizations you want to interact with if you want to reach everyone. Like if you have a limited amount of resources, um, these aren't necessarily the most influential organizations or the most powerful organizations, but they're, they're the organizations with the position in the network that provides access to everyone. So there's, I think, 53 organizations in the network, and if you want to reach everybody, um, then I think you only need to, you know, based on this, you only need to talk to, actually, I think it's only 13 that are in, are in the green. So just another kind of benefit of, of net, kind of a network approach. And just a few takeaways. Um, in terms of the preliminary findings from our network analysis, one thing, and I, you probably already picked up on this, but just like kind of three kind of things that we're, we're gathering from that analysis that really the opportunity for exposure to, to novel and new and rare ideas and resources may be limited in this fire network and the fire prone landscapes. Um, they may be limited by the lack of direct and mediated interactions among a broad range of forest and fire organizations. There's just not a lot of cross pollination of ideas among those two types of organizations based on how we defined it and how we did this analysis. And um, the communication and cooperation may occur more easily among forest organizations than fire organizations because they're more centralized and interconnected. And then the lack of interaction among fire organizations in particular is concerning or potentially concerning because it may p impede um, the manage or could arguably imp impede the management of fire risk across boundaries on the landscape because, you know, in this landscape where fire doesn't respect ownership boundaries and these fire organizations often control, you know, working on certain jurisdictions, if they're not in coordination and in communication, it raises questions on their ability to coordinate their management strategies to affect the flow of, of the connectivity of fuel and the movement of fire across the landscape. Um, and so, just finally, um, I guess the points that I feel like I've tried to make in this presentation is that um, there's a need to understand this community field, this, this field of interactions among organizations or individuals in order to understand the processes by which public attitudes and beliefs and behavioral attentions are formed, either reinforced or, um, or infused with, with um, new influences through exposure to, to new organizations. And the patterns of interaction, I, one thing I, I've tried to argue here is that the patterns of interaction among organizations are particularly important because of the role that organizations play in not only representing the you know, individuals in that community, but really in influencing how members of the community might think, what they might do, um, controlling the information they might have access to as well, the resources that might influence, ultimately influence their behavior. And so an organizational um, 
uh, network approach, I think it can be really helpful in understanding the opportunities and constraints for communicating and, co and cooperating with the public. And then finally, the network structure approach can shed light on opportunities and constraints for communication and cooperation. I've tried to social conditions that promote communication and collaboration and social conditions that promote innovation and social conditions that can actually kind of lead to closure and a re reluctance to, ta to um, entertain new ideas and social structures that can actually um, open up and be amenable to new ideas. So that's the end of my presentation, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Sure. In the back. I, have a, I see the power in identifying those key organizations, those 13 or 15, whatever you said that was. I, have a, I see the power in identifying those key organizations, those 13 or 15, whatever you said that were one or two steps removed from those larger, from, from the rest of the actors, the organizations. I guess my question is, are, are there any similar characteristics or ways that, you know, so you've done all this work on the east side, here on the west side, are there some things that we could, that those organizations have in common that are those key players that we could right. try to, well, you know, identify, yeah, sure look for here whatever. without doing all this if you are interviewing and all the research that you've done? I have a, a familiarity with the key you know, the organizations or, you know, the members of that community field, the you know, community of interest in, in the forest or, um, you know, the public lands, you probably already have a really good idea of who all the organizations are and might be able to just, you know, guess or um, make assumptions about who they interact with. And so uh, you could draw your own maps um, to do this. And I, I think just kind of imposing that discipline you know, on yourselves as you, you know, think about these organizations and who you think they're interacting with. And you can also just get that information from secondary data. You know, which organizations are signing on to the same letter? Which organizations are co-sponsoring the same meeting? Um, which organizations seem to be the ones showing up at, represented at these meetings? So I think that there's ways that you could do it without, you know, using kind of more of this systematic network approach. But in terms of the commonalities between the organizations, I'm not sure if you can assume what those are when you're thinking about those key players. But you might be very well able to guess. So, um, very interesting use of uh, a social network analysis, really interesting area. Um, so, um, it's very interesting use of uh, a social network analysis, really interesting area. Um, I'm wondering, uh, one of the sort of key right. elements here is the interaction. So how did you define right. interaction when you were yeah, so in my uh, interviewing case, or surveying? Interaction was based right. on five questions. So, uh, yeah, and I'm just curious how you define right. it for, for purposes. Which individuals at, another orga at other organizations do you work with um, on issues related to the management or policy surrounding fire prone landscapes and work was planning, paying for, or implementing projects? Um, that was one question. Another question is, who um, do you advise um, in a formal capacity by, you know, sitting on advisory committees or, you know, boards, things like that? How do you get, who do you go to to get information, who are your trusted sources of information, basically? Which organizations or which individuals or organizations do you um, get new ideas from? And then um, who do you seek out um, who has power and influence over these issues? Um, you know, who, who can you not uh, you know, neglect to talk with about these issues because they have a lot of influence o over what gets done? So yeah, every network, you know, you have to have bounded. So you have to kind of decide what you're, how you're going to define those ties and then what the network is. Is it a community of place or an interest? And you have to be really specific about that if you're going to use this network approach. But that's what I did. What did you, so when you said they, they, who do you reach out to, did you have a specific media through which they reached out? Because nowadays we Did you, so when you said they, they, who do you reach out to, did you have a specific media through which oh, they reached yeah, out? Because nowadays inter we know that's what, uh, so direct. Facebook, yeah. email, yeah. and tweeting, so people can... Direct and personal interactions. And the reason why we focused on that is because, depending on how you view, you know, organizations, um, organiz the way I approach it is that organizations are really made up of people. And although organizations may have formal kind of, you know, goal, mission, culture, and um, partners, 
there's also this informal kind of um, um, a, a organizational culture also builds up in, informal from the interpersonal, the attributes and interpersonal kind of relationships among the individuals in an organization. And the extent to which those are diver, divergent, that the formal structure doesn't match the informal, um, implies, you know, basically potential for conflict and breakdown in organizations. And the more that they actually are converged, you know, then the, the you know, the more the less, the less chance. So we kind of focused on the interpersonal building up from the, the bottom. Yeah. So just so I understand the data better, because I had some similar questions to what were asked. Then for any, let's say you called me and said, so just so I understand the data better, because I had some similar questions to what were asked. Then for any, let's say you called me and said, which five people, or who do you call if when there's a fire I might have listed three people at Oregon, I work for Forest Service. I may have listed three different people at Oregon Department of yeah, Forest, so, I mean, one the rural fire asked, department, that, yeah, and somebody so you in wanted research. To frame it that Am way? I one actor? You, know, you could do a network set. just on, you know, response to fire network or something. Or, yeah, I'm I didn't know. Yeah, and so yeah, and so for in this particular case, it was which individuals do you ret routinely plan, pay for, or implement work with? And so that kind of you know back people up a little bit more to who are their partners? Basically, that question is, who are your partners? You know, re regular partners when you're working on, you know, whatever you're. And it was part of a much long, longer interview protocol for where we first start out. You know, what are your goals for the landscape? What kind of pra practices? You know. So we got, I got a really good idea of kind of what they do. And then within that context, you know, who are your, who are your partners, basically, for that one question. But then there are five questions, so you, you, can, you, you sandwich those on top of each other. And then in this case, you know, that was one tie. But yeah, so if they, if they were really just focusing on response to fire, then, and if, you know, yeah. they could say that. I was just trying to ask you, Right. Oh, well, to become a dot in the network, that was basically we created a list of all the organizations that we knew of that played a role, and then we did a snowball approach where we interviewed all those, and, and then from the list, any, any organizations that, that, was named, that were named at least three times, by, no, sorry, by at least three of the interview informants, then they got interviewed. So it was a snowball approach at, at um, constantly expanding who were the kind of key people, key organizations in the network. We need to take a break. Thank you very much. No problem.